Hello everyone, welcome to today's lecture video. Today we will be covering chapter 5, which is an introduction to valuation, the time value of money. So this is one of the most important topics that we cover in this course, and something that we will utilize throughout the rest of the semester when we are trying to value cash flows that occur both today and what their future values are, and also when we're evaluating cash flows that occur in the future and what their values are here today. So what I will be doing, uh, or how I will be doing these calculations in this particular chapter, is I will be using the TI BA2 Plus financial calculator. Um, you can also, there are also equations that are provided for these calculations. You can use either uh, the calculator or the equations. Um, my calculations will be done using the financial calculator listed above there. Uh, but feel free to use the formulas if you would like. You can also use Excel. I don't really cover the Excel calculations um, in my PowerPoint discussions, but there are plenty of resources online on how to utilize Excel to do these time value money calculations. One last thing is please be aware that in the folder on Blackboard titled McGraw-Hill PowerPoints, McGraw-Hill does provide two PowerPoints for this chapter. One is formula-based and one is calculator-based. Feel free to use either of those as an additional resource. But as I've mentioned in the past, I do create my own PowerPoints, and in this PowerPoint discussion, I will be using the TIBA2 Plus Financial Calculator. Now, if you do not have one, um, there are also apps on your phone that you can download that are free, um, that act essentially as the exact same thing as this TIBA2 Plus Calculator. The app looks something like this. So this is what your calculator uh, will look like. And I'll do one or two calculations on here just so we can become familiarized with how to input on our financial calculator. Um, but there are, um, just please be aware that there are other resources available if you do not have a financial calculator. But it would be recommended to have that out now as we work through today's discussion. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Our learning objectives this chapter are, first of all, be able to determine the future value of an investment made today. Then we'll determine the present value of a cash flow to be received at a future date. We will find the return on an investment. And then we will also calculate how long it takes for an investment to reach a desired value. So jumping in, time value of money. What is the concept behind time value of money or TVM? Well, the concept behind time value of money is a dollar in hand today is worth more than a dollar promised at some time in the future. So a dollar in hand today is worth more than that same dollar at some point in the future. Well, why is that the case? Well, think about if you have that dollar in hand today. If you have that dollar in hand today, as opposed to having to wait some time period to receive that dollar, that dollar in hand today has some type of earnings capacity. So you could invest it in some project, you could invest it in some type of security, but it can earn on something if you have it in your hands today. So this whole concept of time value of money is something that we uh, use in any type of decision making. So for example, think about when you buy a car. When you buy a car, you have to make the decision, do you finance the car or do you pay it in full? If you're going to finance the car, what's the interest rate on the loan? And then compare it to what you could earn elsewhere if you, had the, if you kept the money in hand today and invested it in something as opposed to paying for the car in full. Um, so what we are doing in this particular chapter is we are really trying to analyze cash flows and being able to value cash flows that we would receive at some point in the future. Now, before we get into our calculations, one thing that can be very beneficial in this chapter is the use of timelines. So timelines provide an easy way to visualize the cash flows associated with investment decisions. So it won't be the mo of, of the most utmost importance here in this particular chapter, because in this chapter we focus on time value of, of money with just one single cash flow. But as we progress through the semester, we'll start to analyze multiple cash flows uh, that occur at different times, and using these timelines to help visually see the cash flows can be very important. Now, if you think back to chapter one, we talked about cash flows and how maximizing cash flows is essentially the same thing as maximizing the, the stock price, which is the goal of financial management. Remember that there were three characteristics of cash flows that you need to keep in mind. The first characteristic is the size of the cash flow. So what is the actual amount of the cash flow? The second characteristic is the timing of the cash flow. When does the cash flow occur? Does it occur today, one year from now, five years from now? The second characteristic of cash flows is timing. And then the third characteristic deals with the riskiness of those cash flows. So what's the probability or the possibility that, that cash flow actually won't occur? And that's what we'll use as what is called a discount rate to value these future cash flows. So going back to timelines, the use of timelines has three components. First of all is what is the number of periods of the, uh, of the proposal or the project or the investment? 
what is the relevant interest rate, which is based on the riskiness of the cash flows, and then three, what are the actual cash flows uh, that are occurring. So let's do an example. We'll just draw a quick little timeline for this scenario. So suppose we have a $200 investment producing cash flows of $100 in year one, 70 in year two, 50 in year three, and 20 in year four. Assume the relevant interest rate is 5%. Draw a timeline for this scenario. So this is a four-period project or a four-period investment. So our timeline is going to have four periods. And so we have a $200 investment today, which we will showcase as a cash outflow and utilize the negative value there to showcase that is a $200 investment. We will be bringing in $100 in year one, $70 in year two, $50 in year three, $20 in year four. So those are the cash inflows from this investment and our relevant interest rate is 5%, which you typically just put within that first tick mark on your timeline. So what we can see is that this timeline has helped us identify those three main characteristics of the cash flows. What is the size? So what is the actual amount? When did the cash flows occur? So the timing, we can see that the $200 occurred in year zero, 100 in year one, 70 in year two, and so forth. And then the riskiness is what goes into our calculations of this relevant interest rate. So as I mentioned, this won't be um, as much of an issue here with this chapter five material as chapter five is just dealing with one single cash flow. But as we progress, if you ever have any questions about the problem, the first thing you should do is start drawing a timeline for that particular problem to showcase when the cash flows are occurring, um, the timing of those cash flows, the size of the cash flows, and also the riskiness of the cash flows. So with time value money, the first concept that we focus on is future value. What is future value? Future value is the amount an investment is worth after one or more periods. So this is simply taking a cash flow today and calculating what its future value would be based on some relevant interest rate. So this is basically pure investing a cash flow today, figuring out what its future value would be. So some key terms, first of all, is compounding. This is the process of accumulating, accumulating interest on an investment over time to earn more interest. Simple interest is interest earned only on the, on the original principal amount invested. So you do not earn any of this next concept, which is interest on interest. So interest on interest is interest earned on the reinvestment of previous interest payments. And then compound interest is essentially your total interest. So this is interest earned on both the initial principal and the interest reinvested from prior periods. So you can think of this as being the total amount of interest that you earn on an investment. So as I mentioned, you can do these both uh, using equations and calculators. If you are using the equations, here is your general formula for future value. Future value equals the present value times 1 plus r to the t power. You might sometimes see this as 1 plus i to the t power. i and r, are, are, they represent the same thing. And this is your period interest rate expressed as a decimal. So when you're using the equation, you must input the interest rate as a decimal. So for example, if the relevant interest rate was 5%, you would input 0 0.05 into your equation. Now notice then that this is a period interest rate. So if it's annual compounding, you would just put in the annual rate, but if it's semi-annual compounding, you need to make that adjustment and divide it by two. And we'll do that, at, uh, we'll do some examples with annual compounding and also compounding more frequently than once a year. But realize that if you are using the equations, that that R value, your, your interest rate, must be input in on a per period basis. And then T just signifies your total number of periods. Um, another part of this equation that you'll often see is this thing called the future value factor. This is just the second half of the equation. So it's 1 plus R to the T power. Um, before financial calculators, what they would have is they, they'd have these tables that were created based on different interest rates and different number of compounding periods. And then you could just calculate the future value interest factor and multiply it by that present value amount to figure out what the future value was. But now with financial calculators and Excels, Excel and computer programs, um, we can just input the, 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 key, uh, the key inputs to solve for a, a future value amount. So this is if you're using the formula, if you're using the calculator, we have those same five inputs. We have future value, which is your FV. PV is your present value. 
IY is your period interest rate once again. Uh, your payments per year must equal one uh, for your interest per year to be uh, the period rate. So make sure that your PY setting is at one. It should be default at one when you open up, but if you're ever getting wrong answers uh, regularly and you think you're inputting everything correctly, that might be a key reason. And then your interest is entered as a percent, not a decimal. So your calculator knows that whatever you input there is, is actually a percentage. So if it's 5%, you would input 5 as your IY. Again, N equals your number of periods, and always remember to clear your register after each problem. And as it says here, other calculators are similar in format. If I go back to my calculator here, you can see that this is the third row of buttons on the financial calculator. So I can't edit on this app, but your third row of buttons, there you see N, I, Y, P, V, payment, and future value. That is your time value of money row. And you can see up above the future value, CLR, TVM, that is clearing your time value of money row. So what you would do is you'd hit that yellow second button and then hit the, the FV uh, button there and it clears any inputs that you have from previous problems. You'll want to get into that habit of clearing your, your calculator before beginning uh, a new problem. So let's just go ahead and jump into a calculation. So what is the future value after one year of investing $525 in a bank account that pays interest at 8% per year compounded annually? So if we were drawing a timeline here, this is just a one period investment where we are investing $525 to figure out what the future value is if I can earn 8% on this investment. Using my financial calculator, we have present value, we have future value, and you'll notice that I always group the payment, the N, and the IY together. Those all input are always input in on a per period basis. So per period just uh, signifies how often it's compounding. For all of our calculations in this chapter, our payment is zero. In order for you to have a, a value in that PMT function, that cash flow has to occur every single number of periods for whatever you put in there for the end. And that's something that we'll cover in chapter six. So uh, you, in chapter six, we'll start to have inputs into the payment function. But here we will only have... Uh, we will be putting zero in because we do not have a constant cash flow occurring every period. So all of these are going to be input in on an annual basis. Our present value is $525. I'm going to showcase that with a negative uh, cash outflow to showcase that it is a, an investment. And always, you'll, you'll always have one of these be a negative. Um, so you're either going to go from, you, you, you always have some type of cash outflow to some type of cash inflow. Um, even if it's not an actual cash outflow, one of these always has to be negative. Otherwise, you're going to end up getting an error. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. We try to showcase or think of these as cash outflows being negatives, cash inflows being positive. So I'm investing $525. That's my present value. I'm investing it for one period. So my N is one. My interest rate is 8% per year, and I'm going to solve for the future value. So when I input this into my financial calculator, this is how you would input it. So the first thing you have is 525 negative. That is going to be my present value. Well, before I start, let's go ahead and get into the habit of clearing my work. I hit second, and then clear time value of money. That 525 negative is my present value. I do not have a payment. My 8 is my IY, and I'm doing it for one period. And then when I want to compute the future value, I hit CPT, future value, and I can see that that investment would have grown to $567. So the future value here is $567. Now that difference between $525 and $567, $42, that is what is called simple interest. So if you think back to the previous slide, when we defined what simple interest was, well, it was a couple slides ago, Simple interest is interest that is earned only on the original principal amount. This value does not change per year. So if I invest it for more period than one, it's still $42 of simple interest per year as simple interest is interest only earned on the, on the principal amount. Once I reinvest that $42, then I can start earning interest on interest, but that's a different type of interest. Uh, realize that simple interest is interest only earned on the principal amount. So now let's continue with that calculation or with that problem. Let's say now I'm investing that $525 now, but I'm doing so for 10 years at 8% per year. How much simple interest did I earn? Well, what I just told you is that simple interest per year does not change. So the simple interest per year is $42 per year times 10 years, $420 of simple interest. Now, compound interest is your total amount of interest. So in order to know what the compound interest is, I need to know what the future, what the ending value was in the account. So what we're going to do is we are going to solve for the future value. I'm just going to do it up here in this calc or in this uh, area. 
I have present value and future value. I have payment, I have N, and I have IY. And once again, I'm going to input all of these values on an annual basis since it is compounding um, annually. Still no payment. Now my N is for 10 years. My IY is 8. I'm still investing $525, and I want to know what the future value is. So I solve for the future value, and I end up getting a value of $1,133.44. That is my ending value. If I want to solve for how much compound interest I earn, that's your total amount of interest. So I, my ending value is $1,133.44. I invested $525. My total amount of interest then is $608.44. So that is your compound interest. That is your total amount of interest. And then last up, how much interest on interest did I earn? Well, I earned a total of $608.44. Or $608 Simple interest was 420 of that. So the difference then, the $188.44 represents com or, uh, interest on interest. So that's the whole process of compounding is reinvesting interest to earn interest on previously earned interest. Okay, so let's continue on to another example. Now suppose you made a deposit of $10 at 5.5% for, uh, for 10 years and you did this 10 years ago. How much would the investment be worth today? As you can see, I have the inputs listed there on the screen. All we're doing here is if you're concerned about what's going on, we have a timeline here. It is a 10 period investment. I invested $10 in time period zero, and I want to know how much would I have at the end of this 10-year period if I could earn 5.5% per year. So I go ahead and plug in my inputs. Once again, let's showcase how to do this on the financial calculator. I go to my financial calculator. I clear work. I clear my time value of money row. I have $10 being invested today. That's my present value. I have zero as my payment. I'm earning 5.5%, so that's my IY. I'm doing so for 10 years. To solve, uh, that, that would be my end. I compute the future value and I get $17.08. So that investment has grown from $10 to $17.08. And realize that the effect of compounding is small for a small number of periods, but increases as the number of periods increase. So if, as I increase my N, my total number of periods, I start earning more and more interest on interest. And let's showcase how that is. So just going on, same example, but now instead of only having that $10 deposited for 10 years, let's say it's been 200 years. So we have 200 uh, different compounding periods. How much would that investment be worth today? There are my inputs, 200 for my N, 5.5 for my IY, still investing 10 as my present value. Notice that I don't even have payment in here, but your payment would still be zero. Again, that would have to occur every year for the 200 years if I was going to input something in for my PMT function. And I saw for the future value, and my future value is $447,189.84. So what is the effect of compounding on this scenario? Well, what is simple interest? Simple interest does not change. Remember, simple interest would be the 5.5% per year um, of $10. So if I wanted to calculate my simple interest over this 200-year period, I will take the $10 initial, uh, the initial deposit, my total amount of simple interest then is 5.5% of this $10 for 200 years, and the amount of simple interest that I earned on this investment is $120. So what is the effect of compounding? I actually earned $447,069.84 of interest on interest. So the whole purpose of this example is to, just to showcase how powerful compounding is, and the more periods you have, the greater that ending value is, the more interest on interest you will earn on, on an investment. So let's do another example here. The Jimmy G Corporation currently pays a cash dividend of $5 per share. You believe the dividend will be increased by 4% each year indefinitely. How big will the dividend be in eight years? Okay, you're reading the problem. You're struggling to figure out exactly where, where these inputs are and what, what you're solving for. Draw a timeline. So in, uh, you ex they, they pay a $5 dividend currently in time period zero, and you want to know how much will this dividend how much will this dividend be at the end of a eight year period. So we want to know how much will this be at the end of the eight years. Now notice that this is not actually an investment, but we should still in, uh, 
think of it as a cash outflow. If you don't think of it as a cash outflow and have a five dollar, uh, have that five list as a negative, let's look at what happens. So my N, my eight periods is my N. The four is my interest rate per period. I forgot to put that in my timeline. Five is the current value, and then when I solve for the future value, it ends up giving you a negative six dollars and eighty four cents. Now. This does not mean that this corporation's dividend is actually going to go from a positive $5 to a negative $6.84 at the end of the eight years. As I mentioned previously, one of your present value or future values will have to be negative. If you don't input this present value as a negative, it's going to give you your future value as a negative. So one of those will be negative. I just always try to look at it uh, from the point of view of, of like a cash outflow for an inflow. So let's say uh, from the corporation's point of view, they're paying out $5 per year. How big will that be at the end of the eight-year period? Just realize that one of those always has to be negative. When you input your answer on McGraw-Hill Connect, your final answer would be $6.84. You have to realize that that is not actually a negative value. So compounding more frequently than once a year for all of our calculations so far, we've just done annual compounding. Well, what happens if I compound more frequently than once a year? So in this case, what is the future value of investing that $525 for 10 years in a bank account that pays a nominal, which just means of name only, so it has not been adjusted for multiple compounding periods? Um, pays a nominal interest rate of 8% compounded semi-annually. If you're using the equations, realize that your interest rate needs to be adjusted on a per period basis. So they take the 8% and divide by the number of compounding periods per year. In this case, it would be two. And then your total number of compounding periods is the number of years multiplied by the compounding periods per year. So in this case, it would be 10 years times two. Again, I will be using the financial calculator. So let's go future value. Actually, let's just go present value, future value, be consistent. And as I've always, or as I've done previously, I always group these together. Why? Because now instead of inputting all of those annually, I need to remember that I'm going to input these semi-annually. So I still have a zero payment. The N is 10 years, but compounding twice a year for a total of 20 compounding periods and then the IY is 8% per year divided by 2 I get 4% every 6 months so that interest rate per uh, year uh, or the interest rate is almost always provided on a per year basis so we need to make that adjustment to input it um, into the number of compounding periods per year so in this case it was semi-annually so I divided by 2 to input my, my IY on a per period basis I'm investing $525 and I'm solving for the future value. Let's just showcase how to do this on the financial calculator. So once again, I have my calculator open. I clear my time value of money row, and I would have 525 as my initial investment. That is my present value. Still have a zero for my payment. I have eight for the year as my IY, but I divide it by two, and so I would input four for my IY, and I have 10 years being compounded semi-annually, so total of 20 compounding periods, that's my N. I compute the future value, and I get $1,150.34. So I get a future value that is equal to $1,150.34. If you think back to our previous problem, where we were doing it 10 years but annual compounding, our previous problem, or our previous future value was one thousand. What was it? One thousand one hundred and thirty-three, something like that. One thousand one hundred and thirty-three dollars and forty-four cents. So same number of periods, same interest rate, but notice more compounding periods, more interest on interest. So with future value, it's key to realize that future value is exponential. It's not linear. Uh, you can tell that it's exponential just by looking at the equation where we are raising. Uh, uh, the future value factor to a to an exponent. So the longer the time period and the more compounding periods you have, the greater the difference in your future values would be. So that would make sense. You know, more compounding, longer the time period, uh, more interest on interest is being earned. So we can also use this future value equation anytime you have something growing. So you can use it as a general growth formula. It doesn't just have to be uh, something that is used with investments. So looking at this scenario, let's suppose your company expects to increase unit sales of basketballs by 15% per year for the next five years. We currently sell 3 million basketballs. How many basketballs do you expect to sell in the fifth year? So once again, we have present value, we have future value, we have payment, we have N, and we have IY. 
We will be grouping all of these together. Um, we are looking for an annual rate here, so all of this will be input in on an annual basis. Zero payment, we are trying to figure out how much I will have in the fifth year. If my sales are increasing at 15% per year, my three million is my current present value and I'm solving for a future value. Hopefully you realize that if I input this in right now as a positive value, then my output is going to be a negative. And so when I solve for the future value, I get a negative 6,034,072 units. Remember the sign convention, though. This does not mean that I'm now negatively selling these units. My final answer would still be the 6,034,072 basketballs being sold. So that is calculating future value. Now let's move on to present value and discounting. So with present value and discounting, first key term, uh, or what is present value and discounting? Present value is the current value of future cash flows discounted at the appropriate discount rate. Some key terms here is one discount, so that's calculating the present value of some future amount. The discount rate is the rate used to calculate the present value of future cash flows. For our purposes here, that will be provided for us. Uh, we spend a lot of time later in the semester identifying what goes into the discount rate based on the riskiness of the cash flows. We have DCF. This, is, this whole process is called DCF valuation, discounted cash flow valuation, which is simply taking the future value and uh, cash flows and calculating the present value of those cash flows to determine what the value is today. So looking at uh, the formula, your formula is PV, present value, equals future value divided by 1 plus R to the T. This is the same formula as we use for future value except all they did was isolate the present value and rearrange the equation. Um, just like with future value, had a future value factor. The, there is also a discount factor, sometimes referred to as the present value factor, which is simply the reciprocal of the future value factor, so 1 divided by 1 plus r to the t. And when we talk about the value of something, we are talking about the present value unless we specifically indicate that we want the future value. So whenever they say, what is the value of this contract? What is the value of this project? What is the value of any investment? What is the value of anything? We are talking about the present value of those future cash flows. Key findings uh, for a given interest rate, the longer the time period, the lower the present value. So similar to compounding, the more compounding periods, the greater the future value. With discounting, the longer you have to wait for something, the less its present value is. So let's do an example to reinforce that. What is the present value of $500 to be received in 5 years and 10 years if our relevant interest rate is 10%? Once again, if you're confused, draw a timeline. The first one is a 5-period example where now I'm receiving $500 at the end of the time period, and we want to know what would be the present value in time period zero if I discount it at a 10% interest rate. So same inputs on your calculator, except now you're solving for the present value, and you see that we would get a present value of 31046. Once again, one of these always has to be negative, so does that value here for present value actually mean it's a negative value? No. That $500 in year five is worth $310.46 to me in time period zero. Now, if I have to wait 10 years now to receive that 500, and we want to know what is its value today based on a 10% discount rate, the longer I have to wait, the less it's worth today. So we should get a value that's less than 310, and when you plug in these inputs into your calculator, you do get a value that is substantially less than the five-year present value. So it's worth less today if you have to wait longer to receive that cash flow. So as it's uh, stated here in the first bullet, the longer the discounting period, the lower the present value. So the longer you have to wait, the less that present value of that future cash flow is. Key findings continued. So for a given time period, the last one held the, the, uh, the interest rate um, the interest rate constant, so the discount rate was 10%. In this case, now we're having a given time period. The higher the interest rate, the smaller the present value. So what is the present value of $500 received in five years if the interest rate is 10% versus 15%? So here we have two five-period examples. Here we have two five-period examples. And we're still receiving 500 at the end of both of them. But now when we calculate the present value of these two cash flows, one is using a 10% discount rate, one is using a 15% discount rate. 
So notice what happens that with the 10% discount rate, I get a present value of 310.46. At the 15% discount rate, it's actually smaller, 248.59. So realize that there is an inverse relationship between your discount rate and your present value. And this will become very important when we start to value bonds in particular, um, that as your interest rate goes up, so as your discount rate or your relevant interest rate goes up, the present value of future cash flows goes down. So if there's one thing that you really remember about discounting is that there's an inverse relationship between discount rates and present value. As your discount rate goes up, the present value of future cash flows goes down. Once again, this is exponential. Um, so the, as, as the interest rate goes up, the present value of those future cash flows goes down at a more exponential rate. So the thought process or one way that you can think about it is as your relevant interest rate goes up, it's more valuable to have the dollars in hand today. So if you're having to wait for those cash flows, the present value of those future cash flows actually decreases at this exponential rate as your discount rate goes up. So present value example number one. Suppose you need $10,000 in one year for the down payment on a new car. If you could earn 7% annually, how much do you need to invest today? So on the equation, if you wanted to use the, the formula, you would just take that $10,000 and divide it by 1 plus R to the T power, and you get $9,345.79. Or if you wanted to use your financial calculator, which is what I tend to use, These will all be annual base or annual inputs again. No payment. We're discounting it back one period at a discount rate of 7%. And we are discounting back 10,000 now. And I'm solving for present value. Notice that if I input this in as a positive, what do I know my present value is going to be? It's going to come out as a negative. When I solve for that, I end up getting a present value that is the exact same as uh, what I did previously, except that negative sign convention where we know it's still 9,345.79. So, that is calculating for the present value. Let's do another one. You want to begin saving for your daughter's college education, and you estimate that she will need $150,000 in 17 years. If you feel confident that you can earn 8% per year, how much do you need to invest today? So you're reading the problem. As you're going through the homework, you're going to have present value, future value problems uh, mixed in together. So it's important to identify when the cash flows are actually occurring. Let's say you're struggling here, so we draw a timeline. So we know we're going to do something for 17 years. This is a 17-year time period, and we need to have 150000 at the end of the 17 years, and we are confident we can earn 8%. How much will I need today? So we are solving for the present value. Let's go ahead and plug it into our calculators. We'll write out what our inputs are. Once again, we'll just group these together as they're all going to be input in annually. We do not have a constant cash flow occurring every period, so our payment is zero. Our N is 17. Our IY is 8. We need 150000 and we are solving for the present value. Let's just showcase how to do this on the financial calculator for those of you that are following along with yours. Let's get out of this ad. That's the one thing about using the app, the free app, is that you do have to go through some ads occasionally. So let's clear our work. We'll clear our time value of money row. Once again, we have 150000 is what we're going to need as a future value. So that is our future value. 17 is our N. Zero is our payment. And even though it's zero, I still recommend putting that in um, because as I mentioned later on, we'll start to introduce payment uh, inputs. And if you don't have it cleared out from before, it's going to store whatever value you used last time or on the last problem. So I always recommend still inputting in zero. And then the IY here would be eight. And we are computing for the present value, and we would need to have we we would need to invest forty thousand five hundred and forty dollars and thirty four cents to get to that one hundred fifty thousand dollar future value amount. Once again, remember the sign convention. If we input this in as a positive, this is going to come out as a negative. You can think of this being that you would have to. Uh, you, that would be a cash outflow for you because you'd be investing forty thousand five forty and thirty four cents in order to have one hundred fifty thousand at the end of the time period. One more present value example. Sometimes businesses advertise that you should come try our product. If you do, we'll give you a hundred dollars just for coming by. However, if you read the fine print, you find out that they what they do is they give you a savings certificate that will pay you one hundred dollars in twenty five years or so. If the going rate of interest on such certificates is 10% per year, how much are they really giving you today? So once again, a basic timeline for a 25-year period in which they're going to give you $100 
and I'm just skipping over these intermediate parts because there's no cash flows occurring. If the discount rate is 10%, how much are they really giving you when you consider that you have to wait 25 years to receive that cash flow? So we have N is 25, IY is 10, future value is 100. We are computing the present value. The present value, they're actually only giving you $9.23 when you take into consideration how long you have to wait. Now, all of our calculations so far have been compounding once per year. Let's do one where we compound more frequently than once per year. So now we're saving to buy a house in five years. We plan to put down 20% at the time, and we believe that we will need $35,000 for the down payment. If you can invest in a fund that pays a nominal interest rate of 9.25% compounded quarterly, how much will you need to invest today? So what's important here is that we realize that now it is quarterly compounding so all of our payment our n and our iy need to be input in on a quarterly basis so once again we have present value we have future value we have payment we have n and we have iy and once again these all now need to be input in on a quarterly basis since we have quarterly compounding now there's one piece of information here that's irrelevant and it is that 20 percent down we know what the 20 percent down amount is and it's 35,000. so that is the amount that we're going to need at the end of the five-year period so that is our future value, right? We, we can draw a timeline here where we're, we're going to buy a house in five years and they know that we're going, we know that, or we expect that we're going to need 35,000 at the end of the five year period. And we want to know how much will I need to invest today if I believe that I can earn 9.25%, sorry. 9.25% but quarterly compounding. So it would be 9.25% divided by 4 for the per period rate on my timeline. Some people, you'll, some timelines you'll see will be broken down into even more increments based on the number of compounding periods. And then they would just put in that 9.25% divided by 4 value within the first tick mark. Um, so going back to our financial calculator, we are solving for the present value. We still do not have a payment. Our N needs to be input in on a quarterly basis. So it's five years compounding four times per year for a total of 20 compounds. And then the IY would be the interest rate per period, 9.25, but it's compounded quarterly. So we'd actually get, um, what is that, 2.3125 as our per period rate, our per quarter rate. And when I solve for the present value then, I end up getting a present value amount of 22000 $156.14. So that's what I would have to invest today if I can earn 9.25% compounded quarterly in order to have $35,000 at the end of this five-year period. Now, so we've done present value, we've done future value. Now let's move on to calculating a discount. Okay, so now solving for the discount rate. So oftentimes you will want to know what the implied interest rate is on an investment. So you know what you started at, your present value. You knew what the cash flow grew, grew to, so you know the future value, and you want to know what is the interest rate on that investment. So solving or using the equations, you can rearrange it and solve for the R, where you can see that your R would then be equal to your future value divided by your present value, raised to the 1 over T, number of compounding periods, minus 1. Realize that if you are using formulas, you want to make use of both the Y to the X and the 1 over X keys. Um, if you are using a financial calculator, be sure to remember the sign convention or you will, will receive an error. Um, oftentimes you'll see an error 5 or it might even give you an answer but it doesn't make any sense when you are solving for the R, the interest rate, or the T. Uh, so realize that one of your present value or your future value has to be a negative value. Otherwise, you're going to get something incorrect, either an error or it's actually going to give you an answer that is an incorrect answer. Let's take a, take a look at an example here. We're looking at an investment that will pay $1,200 in five years. If I invest $1,000 today, what is the implied rate of interest? So I'm thinking through this problem. I'm confused. Let's go ahead and draw a timeline. Here we have a five-period problem where we are. Uh, they will pay us $1,200 at the end of the five years. I'm investing $1,000 here today, so I'm going to make that a negative value to showcase a cash outflow. And we want to know what interest rate am I earning per year in order to earn to, to for that $1,000 to grow to $1,200 at the end of the five-year period. So algebraically, you can see plugging it into the equation, we get a 3.714% return. Or using your financial calculator, remember that the sign convention does matter. 
Once again, I have it listed slightly different here in the PowerPoint as opposed to how I always write it out when I'm doing it by hand. These will all be input in on a yearly value, an annual value. So we have zero as our payment is a five-year period. We're solving for the IY. The present value is the amount that I'm investing. Remember, it must be a negative or one of them has to be a negative. I like to, like I've mentioned multiple times here, I like to signify cash outflows as negatives, cash inflows as positives. So I'm paying out a thousand, that's my negative value. I'm receiving twelve hundred at the end, that's a cash inflow, I make that a positive. I solve for the IY, I get the same value of three point seven one four percent. Looking at another example solving for the IY or the discount rate, suppose I have a one year old son and you want to provide seventy five thousand in seventeen years towards his college education, I currently have 5,000. What rate must I earn to have 75,000 when I need it? So once again, we have present value, we have future value, we have payment, we have N, and we have IY. I know it's repetitive, but I always keep those together so that I realize that um, those all need to be input in on the same compounding basis. We are looking for just an annual rate here unless it says otherwise. So I have zero as my constant cash flow occurring every time period. We still have not introduced the payment function. We are going to be compounding this for 17 years. We want to know what rate would I have to earn in order to grow $5,000 in current terms, which would be a negative value because that would showcase a cash outflow. And then to have $75,000 as a cash inflow at the end of the 17 years, when I solve for the IY, I get a value of 17.27%. So that is solving for the discount rate. One question that I ask now uh, before we move forward is, can you have a negative discount rate? So previously in our calculations when we're using the financial calculator, whenever we get a negative present value or a negative future value, we said, oh, that's still a positive value, just one of them has to be negative. But if I get a negative IY, does that mean that it's actually a negative value? Yes, you can have a negative IY. That would just signify a decrease in value of the investment or a negative growth rate. So what's important to look at is your present value and your future values. So if your present value to your future value decreases from uh, over the time period of the investment or the time period that you're analyzing, you realize that you actually have a negative growth rate on that particular scenario, whether it be an investment with cash flows or a growth problem. So you can have a negative IY, it just signifies that you actually went down in value as opposed to an increase. Next up, the rule of 72. So what is the rule of 72? The rule of 72 is a rule that is used to approximate how long it takes to double an investment. So the rule 72 is an approximation of how long it takes to double an investment given some interest rate. And your equation is TDM, so time to double money, or it can be used on any, um, on any type of investment. It can be growth of, a, of sales, um, but it's 72 divided by your R, and this is listed as a percentage, not a decimal. So for example, if it's 7%, you plug in 7 as your R. Okay, so how long does it take to double some investment given a, an interest rate? So at what percentage rate of return would I need to invest $10,000 to double my money in 10 years? So what we would do is we want to double it in 10 years. We would do 72 divided by I or R. Should be consistent with the equations. Again, those are pretty interchangeable. And when you solve using the rule of 72, you get a value of 7.2%. So you'd have to earn approximately 7.2% to double your investment in 10 years. Now let's just showcase what happens if I do it using the financial calculator. Notice what is important with the rule of 72. What piece of information is not utilized? When you use the rule of 72, it doesn't matter what you're trying to double. It could be $1, it could be $100, and in this case it was $10,000. It doesn't matter what the initial amount is. It just is how long does it take to double some value. However, when you use your financial calculator, you do have to input the amount that you're trying to double in order to solve for the IY. So in this case, I'm trying to double $10,000. If I'm doubling it, my future value would be $20,000. I do not have a payment. I'm trying to double it in 10 years. What IY would I have to receive? Let's just practice again using our financial calculators here. So once again, I need to clear my time value of money row. So I'm taking 10,000 as my present value. I'm compounding it to double it to a future value. I do not have a payment yet. 
I'm trying to double it in 10 years. When I compute the IY, I get 7.18% or 7.177%. So using the financial calculator, I got my IY to be 7.18%. Notice that these are basically in the same ballpark. Pretty, pretty similar, uh, about two tenths off in terms of using the rule of 72 versus our financial calculator. But let's take a look another, at another example. In this case, what would I have to, or, or what percentage rate of return would I have to earn in order to double my money in two years? So using the rule of 72, it would be two years equals 72 divided by R. When I solve for R, I get 36%. What happens if I use my financial, or if I use the financial calculator? So I have present value and future value. I have payment, I have N, and I have IY. Once again, I'm trying to double 10,000 to 20,000 over a two-year period, what rate of return must I earn? If you do this on the financial calculator, you end up getting an IY that's equal to 41.42%. Much more of a difference between those two values. Well, why? The rule of 72 is a linear representation of something exponential. So think back to your future value and present value equations. We have exponents involved. The rule of 72 is, basic, is simply an equation of a line. So the rule 72 is a linear representation of something that is exponential, so it has limitations. It is actually only correct on interest rates between 5 and 20%. Once you start to get out of, once your interest rates fall outside of those ranges, like it did in this second example, our, the rule 72 is not something that can be used um, as an approximation for how long it takes to double some particular investment. So that's something to keep in mind with the rule of 72. It can give you an idea as to how long it takes to double an investment, but it does have its limitations due to the fact that it is a linear representation of something that is exponential. Let's do another rule of 72 example. So in December 2016, a pair of game-worn shoes with graffiti-style writing that said Oakland Strong used by Steph Curry were auctioned off to benefit the Oakland Fire Relief Fund. The shoes sold for $30,101. The record for game-worn shoes by an active NBA player was $37,740 for a pair of Kobe Bryant shoes, Kobe Bryant worn shoes in the 2008 Olympics. Experts often argue that collectibles such as this will double in value over a 10 year period. So, were the sneakers a good investment? So, what you could do here is you could use the rule 72 that says if it's going to double in 10 years, what rate of return are you getting on your investment? You're only getting a 7.2% return. So, you'd have to take that. Uh, you'd have to take that investment and see, it, based on that risk level of buying some shoes and hoping that it double, is there another investment with a similar risk that would provide a higher return than the 7.2% uh, that this particular uh, doubling would occur? And you can check this again and use your uh, financial calculators and use your financial calculators on this. You would get a very similar answer since that, uh, that IY is between 5 and 20%. So using your financial calculators, we're starting off with a value of 30,101, and we want it to double to 60,202 over a 10-year period. What rate of return must I earn? You saw for that IY, you get 7.1773%. Basically, same ballpark. But once again, just being able to do this so much more quickly using the rule 72 to get an idea as to uh, what type of return you would have to get in order to double some particular investment. So were the sneakers a good investment? Depends on how much of a, a shoe junkie you are and do you feel like the, the growth of 7.2% on an investment of, of shoes is, is worth that, that return in comparison to other particular types of investment and their risk levels. Last up then is finding the number of periods. So how long does it take to go from uh, present value to a future value amount, knowing what the interest rate is, how many periods would it take to get to that amount. So with the equation, you are solving for t, so you're, you're, uh, you are utilizing natural log functions, becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, with a financial calculator, just remember the sign convention. So once again, the present value or the future value has to be a negative value. So let's look at an example. We want to purchase a new car and we're willing to pay $20,000. If you can invest at 10% annual interest per year and you currently have fifteen, dollars how long will it be before you have enough money to pay cash for the car? And then what if I could invest it at 8% compounded quarterly? So we have two, two problems here. Let's look at the first one first. Present value, future value, payment N and IY. For the first problem, it's all annual. 
So this payment is zero. Uh, we are solving for the N. The IY is 10% per year. The present value is 15,000 that I'm investing and I want to have 20. So I put my present value as a negative. My future value is a positive and I solve for the N. Let's go ahead and solve for this using our financial calculators. And I'm going to see what happens if I don't input that in as a negative and see if it reinforces my, my statement about making sure that one of them has to be negative. So I'm growing from 15,000 to 20,000 and I do not have a payment yet. And my, uh, my IY is the 10% per year. When I compute N, there's my error 5. As soon as I see error 5, that is because I did not input in something as a negative. So I remember that my 15,000 is actually what I'm starting at. That's my present value. Now when I compute for my N, I get 3.01. So 3.02, whatever I input everything in as... I get my output in that same format. So since everything was input in annually, this will be 3.02 years for me to grow from 15,000 to 20,000. Now for part two, now we are compounding quarterly and let's see what type of impact that has for your, for your final answer. So here I have present value, future value. That might be the best color yet for this screen. Now all of these need to be input in on a quarterly basis. Your present value and future values are single lump sums. So that's just going to be the 15,000 in present value growing to 20. No payment. My N is what I'm solving for. My IY is 8% per year, but compounded quarterly. So I have to divide by 4 to get an IY that is equal to 2. So now when I go ahead and solve this, let's go ahead and see what we get when I input it in uh, with the financial calculator. Again, repetition to get better at these. 15,000. Negative is my present value. We are growing to 20,000 as my future value. Still no payment. My IY is 8% per year, compounded quarterly for 2% per, uh, per quarter. And when I saw for the end, I get 14.52. 14.52 is the number of quarters, so I need to make sure I divide that by 4 to get the number of years. 14.52 quarters... Since everything was input in on a quarterly basis, that will give me my output in the number of quarters. Apologize for my handwriting there. So I have 14.52 quarters divided by 4 gave me a number of years that was equal to 3.63 years. So 3.63 years would be my final answer there. Okay, so um, interest rate changed. If you received an error on either of these, that means one of them was not input in as a negative. I always, I tend to keep the present value as my negative inputs, but I also look at it from the point of view as that would be a cash outflow as that is what I am investing. So we have done our calculations on one cash flow growing from a present value to a future value, either solving for that future value or taking a future cash flow and solving for a present value. We've solved for an IY. We've solved for a number of periods. Let's just do a, a comprehensive problem wrapping it all up. So I have $10,000 to invest for five years. How much additional interest will you earn if the investment provides a 5% annual return when compared to a 4% annual return? So we are just changing, we have our present value and our future values here. Our payment, our N, and our IY. These are all annual. So our present value is 10,000. I'm going to showcase with a negative to showcase that that is a cash outflow. I'm solving for the future value, uh, zero for my payment. N is five years. First scenario, the IY is 5%. When I solve for the future value, I get a future value that is equal to 12,700. $62.82. The only thing that would change them for this second problem is instead of 5%, I would now input 4.5% and solve for the future value. For the second scenario, I get a future value that is equal to 
461.82. So what is this difference? The difference would be $301. So by earning that extra half a percent over the five year period, I have an extra $301. How long would it take that $10,000 to double in value if it earns 5% annually? Well, two different ways that you can solve this one. 5% is my relevant interest rate. So the rule of 72 says take 72 and divide it by that interest rate. And I end up getting 14.4 years. So that would be an approximation. However, if they want to know specifically, then I need to make sure that I input all of the specifics into my financial calculator or however you're solving these problems. So we have 10,000 as our initial investment. We want it to grow to 20. My N is what I'm solving for. My IY is 5%. When I solve for the N, I end up getting an N value of 14.21 years. So slightly different. For the homework, unless it says to use the rule 72, that rounding difference might be, uh, might be the difference in uh, correct versus an incorrect answer. So realize that unless it says to use the rule of 72, you should use your financial calculators and the equation solving for N. Uh, but this uh, rule of 72 does give us a gauge quickly as to what type of answer we should get to see if we are in the ballpark when we do solve for the final answer. And then last up, what annual rate has been earned if $1,000 grows into $4,000 in 20 years? So we are going to be solving for the IY here. So let's go ahead and get present value, future value, change my colors up again, payment, N, and IY. We are taking 1,000, growing it to 4,000, no payment, 20 is our N, solve for the IY. When I solve for the IY, I get 7.1773%, a common return for this video. So that concludes our chapter five discussion on time value of money and dealing with single cash flows. Very important that you understand these concepts before moving forward as what we begin doing in the next chapter and, and the following chapters after that is instead of dealing with just one single cash flow, then we'll be dealing with multiple cash flows, both of different sizes, so different amounts, and also cash flows that are the same amount for a set number of periods or for an infinite number of periods for that matter. We do problems like that as well. So, um, there are plenty of practice problems both on Connect and also in the practice problem or the extra practice problem video of me working through these different problems. Um, so the best way to get good at these is really to just jump in and do as many practice problems as possible um, and you'll start to become more familiar with how uh, problems are worded and how to identify exactly what's provided and then what you're missing and what you're solving for. So good luck. If you have any questions with anything, don't hesitate to reach out and I'll talk to you all soon. Thanks.